It was March of 2009, about three years after Hurricane Katrina, when I first touched down at Louis Armstrong International Airport in New Orleans, Louisiana. You know, the airport's appropriately named for the famous musician, because as soon as I walked off the plane, a statue of him greeted me. It gave me goosebumps. I think there are two things that happen when you land in New Orleans for the very first time. One, you walk off the plane, you see the statue of Louis there, cheeks full blown, trumpet in the air, and you immediately feel like your life has changed. Or you don't even notice it. I was definitely the former. I was a second year at Stanford Business School at the time, about three months from graduation on spring break. And let's be honest, what 24-year-old doesn't want to go to New Orleans during spring break? I was there on a service learning trip. A handful of Stanford students travel around the world each year with the goal of exploring a social issue while conducting a meaningful project. And my specific project was centered on social impact entrepreneurship. Our goal that week was to provide as much impact as possible for an early stage company working hands-on in the trenches with their founder. My team was, field with, was paired with Kyle Berner, who is the founder and CEO of Feel Goods Flip Flops. So let me tell you a little bit about Feel Goods. Deeply rooted in casual New Orleans comfort, Feel Goods were made for adventures. Kyle first conceived of the business on a backpacking trip to Thailand. His shoe broke, so he wandered into a local market and tried on a new pair of rubber flip flops. They were curiously comfortable, so he started to ask, where are these made? Where else are they sold? Kyle quickly learned they were all natural, biodegradable, and sourced there locally, right in Thailand. He immediately knew he had to share the world's most comfortable flip-flops with the masses. So Feel Good's mission is to awaken conscious capitalism in its customers, as well as provide an economic benefit for the workers in the country where their flip-flops are made. I was instantly inspired by this sort of new emerging business trend, that businesses could connect with their customers and also provide a meaningful impact to society. We met Kyle about a year after that first trip to Thailand. He'd just been contacted by Whole Foods Market, who wanted to carry his product. They said, we'll start with a few stores, and if it goes well, expand across the country. But Kyle had no cash, no marketing plan, no team, and he was really running out of time. So our team's goal that week was to help make the Whole Foods test successful. The crux of our plan was to plan a marketing road tour. We'd travel all through Texas, Louisiana, and Arkansas from Whole Foods store to Whole Foods store on the way. And I thought, what better way to make it successful than join him on the road trip myself? So fast forward, I go back to Palo Alto, grab my diploma, and come back to New Orleans to finish the project I started. One of my classmates and I actually applied for grant funding so that we could join the Feel Goods team as summer interns. So you want to talk about in the trenches. We were really in the trenches with Kyle that summer. We were always under the gun to make a new deadline. For example, our flip-flop shipment got tied up in customs. We learned that the manufacturer had mistakenly used two different straps to make the flip-flops. It was a little bit technical, but one of them was marked Made in Thailand, which is kind of the requisite origin stamp you find on most products you buy in the US today. The other one didn't have it. So half of the flops were technically illegal to possess and definitely illegal to sell. This was a live or die moment for the business. If we couldn't get the shipment released, we wouldn't go on the tour, we wouldn't get the product to the retailers on time, and we'd miss that critical summer sales season. So we were able to sweet talk our way out of customs with a promise that we would go home that night and mark each and every one of those 4,500 pairs of flip-flops with a sticker that said, made in Thailand. So our warehouse, our office, and our home away from home that summer was a dusty basement. It flooded during Katrina and was never rebuilt. We had no AC in the sticky heat of New Orleans summer. Thankfully, we did have a toilet, we just didn't have a door, and we lovingly called it the Flap Cave. So if any of you have spent a summer in the Bayou South, you know it's cockroach season. So we stood there, opening, unpacking, and stickering every single one of those 4,500 pairs as cockroaches fell from the rafters on to our heads. We batted them away and just kept working. We were there till 4 a.m. 
and out on time in the morning for a very successful road tour that did, in fact, land Kyle, that national, feel good, that national Whole Foods launch. So uh, these are a little small on the screen, but um, these are a few pictures of our feel-good summer. So that's our tiny team at the um, Whole Foods headquarters in Austin, Texas. That's our flop mobile, um, and of course at the bottom, the beloved flop cave. Hope is a requisite starting point for an early stage entrepreneur. The business is so fragile in those early days. You have to believe in the vision and that it's possible to achieve. The business, it's, early on, it's, it's a little bit hard to describe, you know, but early on, those moments of hope, they're just amplified because there's so much at stake. So since then, I've wondered a lot about that feel-good summer. What was that insatiable drive I had to help Kyle and the business succeed? Why in the world would I stay up until 4 a.m. with cockroaches falling on my head? I think the first reason is the undeniable, tangible impact. Second, it was the mission and purpose I found in being part of something bigger than myself. That summer, I realized that entrepreneurship was the exact intersection of business and social change that I'd been searching for. And I knew for the very first time that business could change the world. This is not a singularly held belief. The climate in New Orleans is actually driven by people who agree. An organization called the Idea Village is at the center of the movement. The Idea Village is an entrepreneur, or it's a community for entrepreneurs and those who believe in them. They've been working for 15 years to help support startups in the Big Easy. And I actually moved there for two years to aid in the effort. So like most businesses you might imagine started in the cocktail capital of the US, the Idea Village was started in a bar. New Orleans wasn't really known for anything more than that at the time, and at least not anything good. Great businesses are founded because they solve a problem. And this was the problem in New Orleans at the time. So obviously the population tanked during Katrina, but it had actually been on a steady decline for decades. And if you followed, these are the kind of headlines you'd see. Brain drain, worst day for kids, famous for murders, terrible football team. So this was the problem that they were trying to solve. So five guys got together in a bar and started the Idea Village because they saw their city going down the tubes. It started with a business plan competition. They started in 2000 and they nurtured that for five years. Then, disaster struck. I can't tell you what it was like to evacuate the city of New Orleans during Hurricane Katrina and come back months later. But imagine, if the city of Cincinnati was underwater tomorrow, not just Xavier, though Xavier in this room would be underwater too, but every school, every church, every hospital, every business, every home, would you move back? It was a catalytic moment for the city of New Orleans. And just like those early days at Feel Goods, the idea that it needed people who would just show up and make a tangible impact. So the first few years were just recovery. Then they watched, launched the MBA consulting program that I participated in as a spring breaker. Then they started something called New Orleans Entrepreneur Week, which has since become their flagship event. So New Orleans Entrepreneur Week was launched not just to engage locals, but also attract national innovators, funders, and investors. That first year, when I was working with Kyle during spring break, we helped five entrepreneurs. There were about 100 people there. I was just at New Orleans Entrepreneur Week last month. This year, there were 10,000 people there. From five people, to 10,000. And it's not just that the Idea Village has identified and supported more companies, it's that their hope in the city of New Orleans has actually made it a more entrepreneurial place. So this is a quick graph, it might be a little hard to see, so I'll try to explain it. This shows the average number of startups per capita across the US. That green line that's up and to the right, that's New Orleans. It's actually 60% above the national average for entrepreneurial activity now. And the headlines have changed too. They were on the cover of Entrepreneur Magazine in 2009, a blueprint for economic recovery. They've been in, oh, you can't see the headlines, but they're really good too. Uh, <laughs> the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, and actually just a couple weeks ago after this past New Orleans Entrepreneur Week, um, the headline in Forbes was that the world was focusing on New Orleans. What a crazy idea that the world is gonna focus on New Orleans not for their murder rate, but for entrepreneurship. So for me personally, it comes back to this overarching theme of being part of something bigger than myself. A few of my friends in the audience here might th say that this is where I actually found my calling, 
Uh, that is the kitchen of Dana Gardens, for anybody who knows. I did flip burgers and serve those fresh cut fries two nights a week my senior year. Um, but, on, but in all honesty, I think that, um, that that experience really showed me what is possible when you believe in entrepreneurs as an agent of change. So I found, um, even since my time at Xavier, that this idea of can you uh, merge the intersection of business and social change has been something I'm really passionate about. When I was here on campus, I spent part of my time as the head of X Action in running Community Action Day. I was an approach leader. And then on the other side, I was a finance major and COO of the D'Artagnan Capital Fund, which is an investment fund managed by Xavier students. Um, and I was applying for business school. So I always had this tension between my mind and my heart that told me I wanted to pursue great meaningful change in the world and also be successful by more monetary standards. I always wondered, did I have to choose or could I do both? So I happened upon this diagram a couple of years ago on Pinterest. I tracked it down to the blog of a woman named Dorothy Shapland. For me, it really resonated because it's helped to define the factors that I've really tried to balance um, over the years in pursuing new opportunities. So first, what you love. What is it that gets you excited to try and do more? Then, what the world needs. Have you identified a problem by individuals, groups, or society that isn't being solved today? Then, what the world will pay for. What are the financial factors? Who funds that type of problem? And then, what you do well. What are your innate skills and abilities? And what have you done to strengthen them over time? The center of this graph, that really should say career and mission alignment, so we're just gonna go with, it says, pretend it says career and mission alignment. Uh, so the center of this graph, you know, I always wondered, could I find something that would fit that exact center? And what I've learned is that entrepreneurs are constantly seeking for the center of that graph. They're always wondering, have I built a team that can execute on this problem? What problem am I solving? Am I passionate about it? So entrepreneurs really live at the center of this diagram, and great businesses will accomplish all four of these characteristics. So it's not just in New Orleans that I've seen this happen. I actually launched a small business of my own last year and traveled around the country helping organizations to identify entrepreneurs in their communities and support them. That work took me from Kansas to California, from West Virginia, all the way to South Africa. And the consistent theme I saw is that local leaders were launching programs that would support new leaders. It was all about people investing in people. Now, as an entrepreneurial person myself, I'm always looking for the next challenge and opportunity. So while I love the city of New Orleans and I will always support their movement, let me give you a sense of scale. Last year in the state of Louisiana, there were nine documented venture capital deals. You take a look at the state of California, that number was over 2,400. So I knew that if I wanted to amplify my impact to the best and fastest growing companies, I would find those in California. I know what you're all thinking, like, oh, working with startups in San Francisco, I bet it's just like Silicon Valley. It kind of is, some days, a little bit like Silicon Valley on HBO, a little bit like Shark Tank. Uh, but let me give you an inside look of what it's really like. So I joined an early stage venture capital firm. It's called Maven Ventures. Venture capital is defined as money invested in a new or growing business with a substantial element of risk. The stats say that 75 to 90% of startup businesses will fail. It's definitely a substantial risk. So now, in addition to working with founders hands-on every single day, I also invest financially. It's a new angle, but there are a lot of similarities. Venture capital is inherently an optimistic and hopeful business. We have 22 companies in our portfolio. I'll tell you right now, every single one is worth a billion dollars. The next Uber, the next Snapchat, the next Instagram, I've invested in them all. But the stats say, let's be realistic, only likely a few will survive. So these great game-changing businesses would never exist unless investors were waiting in the wings saying, we believe in you. We review about 2,500 deals per year to find 15 to invest in. So we have a lot of filters. The first and most important is what we like to call a vision worth fighting for. So for us, that means that the entrepreneur is doing something that they're passionate about that really is filling a need in the world. I mention that because it's one of the driving reasons that I took this specific job. At a social mission company like Feel Goods or a nonprofit like the Idea Village, the mission is always front and center. Sometimes that's at odds with growth and financial success. But from this angle, I've learned that those two things don't have to be mutually exclusive. I'll give you an example. One company in our portfolio is called Epic. 
It's the largest platform for kids' eBooks. They're making it as easy for kids to access books on mobile devices as they can access games. Another one of our investments is a company called Cruise. It's the first highway autopilot. That's right, it's a self-driving car. Can you imagine the stress and injury that will be eliminated when something like that exists? So I always believed and hoped that it would be possible to align all four of these elements. You know, no career is perfect, but from where I stand now, I truly believe that hope is present nowhere more than in the eyes of a startup founder. For now, I've found alignment between what I love, which is working hands-on with early stage companies, what I do well, which is connecting them with the right resources, what the world will pay for, which is great financial investments, and what the world needs, more meaningful companies building great jobs. So entrepreneurship is my passion, but I know that's not the same for everyone. So I'll give you a few thoughts on identifying your own personal mission, and I encourage everyone here to explore what that might be for you. First, know yourself and recognize your passion. What is it that gets you excited? What can't you stop talking about with your friends? I'd encourage you to write about it, jot down those meaningful moments, and make a note about why they mattered. I've done this over the years, and it gave me so much joy and renewed energy to look at those notes in preparing for this talk. Second, just do it. You have to take risks, and you have to make tough decisions to follow your passion. One idea is to chart out all the courses and all the paths that you have in front of you and think, what doors will open for me if I choose this path? What doors will close? Find the most exciting outcomes and choose that path. I've also lived by the mantra, if things change, I can change my mind. You can always choose a new path, and you'll likely never regret something you tried in pursuit of your passion. And third, it's your job to connect the dots. Gather meaningful relationships and stay in touch with people who matter. I'll tell you now that every single consulting client or job I've had since graduating from business school has come from my network, not an application process. So those relationships really matter. Take stock of how you're balancing your own passion and profit, and connect the dots between your own meaningful experiences over time. When I look back and connect the dots of my own journey thus far, there's a string that connects them all, and it's that business can be a driver of great social impact. The hope we have in ourselves and others, as founders, as funders, as supporters, really might change the world. So that's what I'm investing in. But there truly are a million ways to change the world, from flip-flops to finance and everything in between. So, as good old Louis says, we all sing do re mi, but you gotta find the other notes yourself. So find the right notes to your own song, and I can promise it will be an amazing journey, but hopefully without the cockroaches. Thank you.